Hello, everyone. I'm Rusty Dunn. Time traveling yet again, reaching back into history with my friend and colleague, Caterpillar's corporate archivist, chief historian, Lee Fosberg. Lee, how are you? Thanks, Rusty. Good to see you again. This reminds me of being at like the end of the Raiders of the Lost Ark with that vast government mm -hmm. warehouse. This is where we are. We can't disclose our location, mm -hmm. but it's sort of like that. Yeah, we're kind of opening the crate, right? We always talk about big moments in Caterpillar history, big machines. Today we're talking about someone... I'm going to guess most employees have never heard of, but he was a really important guy uh, in the history of Caterpillar, one of our first executives. Um, mm -hmm. And his name was Byron Claude Hecock, B.C. Hecock. That's right. So tell us about sure. Claude. Well, you know, a very interesting person, right? And we'll find kind of a very human and in certain ways kind of a quirky person, right? But he was a great leader at a very tough time for the company. And as you take us through this, keep in mm -hmm. mind, this uh, this gentleman uh, made his way up to becoming the company's second president, yeah, but, C CEO, as, yeah, as we would so know it today. That That's what we call it. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, Claude had a very hard scrabble start. Grew, yes. up, grew up in Kansas. Yes. Give us a little background sure. of his of his ba uh, of his uh, early days. Well, you know, he would say that no one would take want to take the route that I took, you know, to get to the top. And he was born in Kansas and he came from really a large kind of farm family, a poor family. He started working, believe it or not, at the age of 7, and he called it summer camp. But that's when he started, you know, working in the cannery and doing things around the farm in Kansas. If summer camp is working 10 hours a day in a cannery, I, don't, I want yeah. no part of summer yeah. camp. But <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I'd have signed up for that one. But yeah, his journey kind of brought him to a bunch of different jobs, but he ended up having a great mentor who saw something within him and pushed him to take correspondence courses. And he became an accountant. But, you know, what, what's fascinating is, you know, this is a time period we're talking, you know, pre-1920s. People didn't move around and stuff a lot. Well, he did. He had a journey. He went from Kansas to Detroit. And then he ended up going to San Diego, which, you know, back then was, you know, not very populated. But he ended up going to San Francisco, and that's where his luck changed. I was going to say, he, so he's he's getting toward, I think, around the age of 30. Finally, he gets a job with not Caterpillar. Caterpillar mm -hmm. wasn't in existence mm -hmm. yet, but with, with CL Best. Yes, yeah, so CL Best was one of the companies that merged to form Caterpillar. And he started as kind of an auditor and worked up through the company, but he ended up connecting with RC Force, the individual who was kind of running best, and he kind of took him under his wing. When Holt merged with the best company to form Modern Day Caterpillar, Force brought him over, and he first started working for Cat. So Force brings him over. He's mm -hmm. 36 years of age. Sure. We have the Caterpillar Tractor Company. Mm -hmm. And so that was fateful in, in terms of... Uh, force then retiring and mm -hmm. here's mm -hmm. his and then here is is claude's opportunity right well yeah and claude first he proved himself when the companies merged together they had to create a dealer network like the dealer network we have today he was very instrumental in making that happen and really working with groups right kind of the services that we provide through our dealer network that would have kind of you could argue all started with hecock so what happened was mr force retired and Hecock, he became our president in 1930. So Claude was literally among the earliest thinkers when mm -hmm. we think about the concept of the dealer network yeah. and yeah. aftermarket services yeah. Uh, yeah. to our customers. Yeah. Take us through his tenure then as yeah. president. Um, uh, big opportunities, but huge sure. challenges during that right. time. Right. So, I, you know, the first problem was right in 1929, you had the stock market crash, the Great Depression. So he inherited a company with the beginning of that. So he came in at a time like, what is going to be the strategy to make it through this depression, right? A lot of companies were going out of business. Really, it was his leadership that brought us out of this time of great troubles. And he really did it through several different things. One was investing in technology. We came out in 1931 with the first diesel engine in a tractor that was like commercially successful. And what that meant was, Think about this, Rusty, for like a game changer. Two years later, we produced over half the diesel horsepower in the U.S. So he was a superior innovator. This is yes. a guy who, he was such, as you've talked about, an out-of-the-box thinker, heck of a marketer, too. Oh, I mean, absolutely. in terms of, the, you think about changes to the brand and things that happened during mm -hmm. his tenure. Well, let me ask you this, Rusty. What color are 
our products today. Oh, of course, there are Caterpillar Yellow. Right, they're yellow. Well, that goes back to Heacock. And you got to remember, we were when we merged in the 20s, we were an ag company, but very quickly becoming the earth mover we know today. Right, right. So for safety reasons, right, they wanted to change these gray tractors into a different color. Heacock got very personally involved helping select through a number of different colors, and that's how we came up with yellow. So he is literally the guy who was there in, that's right. in the room leading the way, taking us from gray to yellow. Absolutely. And it, beyond fascinating beyond that from a marketing perspective he also had some other ideas of how he wanted to illustrate our oh, our, our becoming global right the, the whole and best product were very global products but he also saw you had to have you know global markets to succeed right and to make the point we had a company showroom which was in east peoria where we displayed all of our products but to show visitors where we were he had this giant globe made with little lights on it for where across the globe all of our products were sold. So when they would do like a plant tour, they would bring people through and say, look, the Caterpillar tractor is across the globe. So very attuned mm -hmm. also to the brand. Yes. Now, Claude Heacock was probably not a guy with a lot of spare time on his hands, but we know this. He liked golf. He loved and golf. And when he was in Peoria, he was one of the early members of the of the Peoria Country Club. He was, right? And it, only fitting the Peoria Country Club because, like, our products actually helped build it. You know, and we have pictures in our collection on that. But it was his style, let's say, where he would golf without a shirt, <laughs> which was a little against the rules, but, right, he was Claude Heacock. They, did, they didn't kick him out. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, this other thing is he would wait till the 17th hole, and then he'd do bets with his group because he knew, like, the 17th and the 18th hole were his best holes. So that's where, you know, that's where the accountant in him came across. So, What a character. So he had an 11-year tenure then as, yep. as president of, mm -hmm. of the company. Um, but didn't necessarily slow down even after he stepped down as president. Well, he was seen as really such a leader in you know the world of earth moving that when World War II broke out, he was given the job with the government as a head of all procurement for war materials except for tanks. So think about what a big job that was. And he maintained that job. He said, I'll keep the job as long as they want me. And that was his kind of little saying. And after the war... He came back to Cap and he served on our board. Till what, early 60s, yeah. I guess. Yeah. You, you would always you would love to get a sense of by hearing from him, seeing him. And we've learned we can actually hear him. We can hear him. So we have a pretty rare recording that was done um, after he came back, in, I think in the 1950s, 1960s. And what he does is he talks about his leadership moments. So you think about how rare this is. This is a guy, right, that was from our original board of directors, you know, was a major player in the 20s, the 30s, early cat. And we have these moments from him. It's really, really quite special. I love it. Watch and listen. It, it isn't anything big that any one does. It's the sum total of the million little things that are done effectively. Selling true value, rendering wonderful service, serving customers, treating everybody all right, building honest product, honest machine, good machine, product that was honestly sold for a useful wealth producing purpose, taking care of little things, knowing that every big thing is made out of little things. Fascinating to hear in his own words, obviously, later in his life. Um, his thoughts about mm -hmm. running the company. Yeah. And at the beginning, it looked like he was speaking into a radio microphone. He was. Those those first couple of pictures. Right. What was that? So, you know, right, this was a guy that was kind of, he was cutting edge, right, for his time period. And he kind of wondered, what is the best way I could deliver the importance of the company's annual report, right? We do an annual sure. report today to deliver to, you know, the 20,000 plus people that work for CAT. He did it through the radio. And so he would do a radio, kind of his own little 
fireside speech right from his office in East Peoria. So they were setting up literally for a radio yeah. broadcast, those pictures yeah. we saw. Absolutely. And I think that's probably, it hits me, that's one of the reasons he was well-liked, beloved by his employees. And yeah. did, they, have, they had a nickname. They him. had a nickname. He was known as the Colorful Accountant. The Colorful Accountant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we're still talking about it after all of these decades. That's, that's, that's right. something about uh, a very colorful a quirky gentleman who really helped um, form the um, the company that we are today. That, yep. That's what what a great um, what a great story, Lee. As always, thanks so much for sort of bringing that to the forefront. We always love it. Always a pleasure, Rusty. Always great digging in, into history here, and we'll be bringing you more stories as well. We appreciate you watching today. Go out, be safe in everything you do. Talk to you next time.